A very good afternoon. I'm going to have to sit here because the paper is not working, so please excuse me. So I will very briefly give you an update on the rule of law for human rights in ASEAN, the path to integration, um, a brief overview of the structure of the city. So as Dr. Para mentioned earlier, this is an update of our 2011 rule of law based on study, um, which sought to shed light on ASEAN member states' understanding, interpretation, and implementation of the rule of law as a principle of good governance in relation to strengthening the respect for and protection of human rights. So this study, the path to integration, uses the same core principles as well as the same indicators that were used in the 2011 studies. But why study the rule of law in ASEAN in the first place? So as a springboard for the first study as well as for this study, we use as inspiration the ASEAN documents. If we look at the 1967 ASEAN Declaration, otherwise also known as the Bank Declaration, it states there that the aims and purposes of the association shall be to promote regional peace and stability through abiding respect for justice and the rule of law in the relationship among countries of the region and adherence to the principles of the United Nations Charter. So even then, even during the creation of the ASEAN, we already recognized the importance of the rule of law and that we saw it as a, as a means to achieving regional peace and stability. Later on, the term rule of law was again used in different documents and you can find examples of those documents in the book. I think it's on page 57, so um, to enumerate the, the, the instances that we mentioned in the key ASEAN documents. But I wanted to highlight the ASEAN Charter, which was issued in 2007. In the preamble, it says that the ASEAN member states should, among others, adhere to the principles of democracy, the rule of law, and good governance, respect for and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Later in Article 1, Paragraph 7, it says there that the object and purpose of the ASEAN are, among others, to strengthen democracy, enhance good governance and the rule of law, and to promote and protect human rights and fundamental freedoms with due regard to the rights and responsibilities of the member states. Now we highlight this because it, this indicates a shift, whereas in the 1967 declaration, the rule of law was seen as a vehicle, as a means to achieve regional peace and stability. This time in the ASEAN Charter is recognized as a purpose on its own. So it's something that we want to achieve, not to obtain something else, but because it's a goal, it's a purpose of the ASEAN. But how do we define, how do we begin to analyze rule of law since the ASEAN Charter does not provide a definition? And so we look, this study as well as the 2011 study uses the UN definition, which was um, uh, given by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2004, when he said, the rule of law refers to a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. And then he also said, it requires as well measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency. So that's a very long paragraph with the last principle. So what the original lead researcher did was to dissect this into four principles. The first being, the government and its officials and agents are accountable under the law. The second, laws and procedures for arrest, detention, and punishment are publicly available lawful and not arbitrary. The third one, the process by which the laws are enacted and enforced is accessible, fair, efficient, and equally applied. And then central principle four refers to justice is administered by competent, impartial, and independent judiciary and justice institutions. But this, just looking at these principles, it can be a bit big and you want to look at them for their elements. So, uh, Mada, the original uh, lead researcher, also created subsections, um, which we call indicators, which you can see on page 51 of the book that we gave out. So 
These central principles are further broken down into subsections. So five, as mentioned by Tato Parag earlier, since the 2011 baseline study was issued, a lot of things have changed, including the launch, formal launch of the ASEAN Community Day last year. And so this, this current research, it aims to consider whether individual member states' commit, commitment to establish and maintain the rule of law as, um, as, as mentioned in the ASEAN Charter was being upheld and to analyze legislative changes that had taken place in the ASEAN member states and whether they supported or detracted from ASEAN's vision of a rules-based community. So as mentioned, the study draws heavily from the UN definition and uses the Supreme Court ASEAN documents and recent developments. The study covers all 10 ASEAN member states. So the book that you have contains 10 country reports as well as one synthesis report and relies on country-specific data and analysis by country rapporteurs with backgrounds in academia, public policy, and law. The country reports are based on laws and secondary sources. They were not required to conduct surveys or to uh, conduct interviews, although some of the researchers approached government officials to ask for published material or publicly available data. Um, the, the research, the, the country rapporteurs, the country operators were recruited late last year and they began collecting data in January until uh, April and then throughout the month of March. Throughout, throughout the, March, the month of May, we finalized and edited the report. So it's designed as a short term project. So the country reports are organized as follows. The first part is an introduction which contains key rule of law structures, the foundation and evolution of the rule of law. The human rights treaties, the, the four human rights treaties that the same member states acceded to, and how it's incorporated into local laws and whether they are cited by, um, by, by the courts. And then also, we look at interpretation and use of the term rule of law in the constitution and laws and, and also official policy statements. And then the second part looks at country practice in applying the central principles of rule of law for human rights, which, as I mentioned earlier, are the four principles, the first one being the government, its officials, and agents are accountable, and so on. The third part, because um, the vision of ASEAN is to become a, a rules-based, people-centered, people-oriented community, um, we also look at the progress, the opportunities, and challenges that countries that individual member states are facing in regards integrating into a rules-based ASEAN. And the last part throws some conclusions. But with this awesome amount of information, Mr. Tamprasa created a synthesis report which highlights regional trends and also significant events. The research team is comprised by Mr. Francis Tom Tamprasa, lead researcher who was with us who worked with HRC to develop the country templates, and then we had 10 country researchers. As in our other studies, as much as possible, the HRC tries to get citizens from the member states when they report on that country, so as much as possible, a, a, a resident or a citizen reports on the country um, that is contained in the, in the baseline or in, in this study update. So we were successful in doing this in these projects for two countries, for Brunei and for Lao PDR. For Brunei, we had to ask um, a lecturer at Monash University, a German, to write the research. And for Lao PDR, we had to ask a Filipino lawyer to, to write the, the, the report. We are joined right now with some country researchers, and I would just like to stand up with some other name. Mr. Vijay Pun from Cambodia, um, Ms. Kim Ule from Myanmar. I don't know if Vivi plays you. Vivi? No. Not yet. Okay. So thank you very much for your hard work. The, the research team was guided by two expert advisors um, who, who guided us during the drafting of the terms of reference of the report of the design the report, as well as edited all 10 country reports and reviewed them and approved them, and the synthesis report. So one of them is Professor Kevin Tan of the National University of Singapore, and the second one is Professor David Cohen of the WSD Handa Center for Human Rights and International Justice at the Stanford Center, who is with us today. So David, thank you very much for your guidance. And now, I would like to take us to the next part of the agenda, the main event. And I would like to call um, Professor Caroline Hernandez and 
Mr. Kong, the browser will please join me, or do you want to sit there first? Okay, so yes. So we will now hear uh, Mr. Francis Kong and Prasa, but first allow me to introduce him. Francis Tompkins Plaza is a lawyer who teaches at the Ateneo de Manila University Law School. He also teaches public international law and legal counseling at the Far Eastern University Institute of Law and Public International Law at the International Studies Department of New York College of Philippines. He previously also taught um, forced migration. Currently, he is legal advisor to the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. From 2009 to 2013, he worked for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, after which he joined public service. He has written on international law, human security, judicial training, statelessness, forced migration, and campaign finance. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of the Philippines and a Jewish doctor from Ateneo de Mandela University. He is a Carnegie Fellow, Pacific Fellow of the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. He is an incoming Master of Law student at the University of Michigan Ann Harbor as David Fellow, where he has also been awarded with a brochure scholarship. So Tom, I will turn over the floor to you.